The object is not objective, or you always wonder what happened on the other side of the hay wain. A fictional response to Jason Brooks's The Subject is Not the Subject by Will Self. He met me at the station driving an Austin A40 Farina. I know something about cars and remarked on the concourse condition of this vintage proto hatchback designed by the legendary Pina Farina of Turin. He said, you haven't seen anything yet. He drove me through the nondescript environs of the town and out into the countryside, still flocculent with foliage despite the time of year. What time of year was it? Well, I confess, I've forgotten. You know how it is nowadays. There's so very much detail to remember. All too often you lose sight of the wider picture. These are part Trump Loy and part not, he remarked, his words appearing to me black and bold in the car's noisy and dim interior but from a distance or in a photographic form, you wouldn't know the difference. A big man with the diffident movements of someone only too aware of his own strength, he gestured at a small group of farm buildings, then, slowing the Austin, wound down the window so he could point with a capable hand. It's the same when you look down the side. You can see... You wouldn't have thought such a large man speaking with such authority could nonetheless trail off. But he did. He trailed off as he removed his foot from the accelerator and the car trailed to a halt by the woolly verge. He turned off the engine, opened the car door and hefting himself out indicated with an abrupt slash of his arm that I should follow. We climbed a steel five-bar gate and walked towards the farm buildings. Well, he resumed, for me it's a way to access different ways to articulate paint, ways I would never have thought of if I were being descriptive, attempting, say, to portray a tree or water or any of these elements of the rural scene. He indicated the four-square lime-washed cottage, really a fairly substantial house of two stories, with high, steeply pitched roofs of old and undulant tiling and beside it a weedy mere and beyond this a thicket of trees he led me towards the corner of the building and looking down the side I could indeed see that its solid appearance was mostly illusory that the cottage was in fact a sort of flat or coulisse, the kind you see in the theatre, the surface of which had been worked up using a complex set of techniques to suggest both three dimensions and their subtle weathering. The idea of disrupting the way things are, made by introducing a certain sense of awkwardness or, ha, well, he laughed shortly, you know, there's something kind of intriguing about that. We walked back to the front of the cottage, circumventing the deep water-filled hoof marks of cattle and the dollops of goose and duck shit bedizzening the front yard, or at least these appeared to be dollops of shit from a distance. Drawing nearer, I dropped involuntarily to my knees to scrutinise them. Where it appears as if they're dripped, he said, they're not drips, they're paint, hand-painted drips. And where you've got areas like this, he pointed to the churned up mud, they're actually airbrushed rather than impasto. He hung his head, seemingly overwhelmed by the job in hand. True, I scarcely knew him, and we certainly weren't intimates, yet something in his manner freed me from the usual constraints. You want to be liberated from the tyranny of your compositional mind, I ventured, and shaking his overweight head, he replied, there is an element of that, yeah, absolutely. Part of these things came out of a desire to make landscape, but I couldn't justify it. The idea of placing myself in the landscape as some sort of latter-day plein-air painter made no sense to me. This made no sense to me. Weren't we in plain air? Yet even as I contemplated this, I became aware of the sky's absence, no confident swirls of cumulus, strokes of cirrus, and palette knife smeared chunks of cumulonimbus mounting up from the tree-lined horizon, only sturdy beams with whitewashed intervals. Observing my confusion, he hastened to reassure me. I used to tell my students, making a landscape painting in a highly traditional manner or painting a vase of flowers could well be the most subversive thing you'll do while you're at art college. 
You should always make the thing you think no one would ever want. That's what I'd say to them, which rather begged the question, what's the most subversive thing you've done since leaving art college? So I asked it, and he replied, I made this small series of paintings based on Dutch cabinet paintings. They're all of women urinating, peeing in the landscape, and they're very tiny. They were indeed very tiny. A spattering of imagery across the faultlessly smooth wall of his studio. I drew closer to one and she yanked up her knickers, fastened her jeans and wandered off towards the blue forgotten hills. That was about as close as I could get to genuine irreverence, he said. A kind of je m'en foutism towards landscape itself. As if responding to my own irreverent gaze, the serried peeing women all rose, all rearranged their clothing, then the whole lot of them decamped behind the cottage. I often think in series, yeah, he read my mind. So everything works in series, and within this show, there are three series of works. The question that torments me is, how can you make that and then make this? And how do these things live together? He did indeed appear tormented, pirouetting heavily around the studio, pulling out canvases from behind workbenches and stacking them along the walls so they lowered at us. He stood back, clever hands on hips, and examined this family of frank faces. All of them have elements which are unfinished, he told me, and they're left. Because it's not about me starting at A and finishing at B simply in order to prove I can cover the whole paper. When one's done enough, that's it. They are what they are. They were what they were, true enough. Faces at once fully achieved with a clarity of expression that made me feel both exposed and yet strangely inconclusive. I'm not interested in people smiling, you know. He breathed in my ear, because I think obvious facial gestures encourage the viewer to assume a narrative, and that takes the painting somewhere else. The crop is integral, because it's about intensifying the gaze, and all these people have a relationship to image in some way, shape or form, and for me, a very discerning eye which introduces the idea that you, as the viewer, are at the same time being viewed. Yes, viewed by two large men, hunched down in the front seats of an old Austin A40 Farina, hunched so low that the top edge of the windscreen slices cleanly across their foreheads, intensifying the gaze. I was caught in the headlights of their vision, even as they broke the picture plane of the windscreen and dove towards me in a particulate cloud of shattered glass, death-born Aphrodites. I only use black paint, he interrupted my fugue. There's no white paint. The white showing through is the background. And I use a scalpel to scratch, then pull back the paper. All my work involves this fetishism. Sometimes I think it's the scratching and pulling which constitutes the work. The finished results are somehow besides the point. Yes, I was beginning to get the point of all his scratching, or at least get beside it. He'd made me a cup of tea, and looking down into the mug, I saw that the surface tension of the liquid supported an archipelago of scale. I sipped and said, the works themselves, well, perhaps a good way of viewing them is that they're an encephalogram of your brain when it's in the flow. He shook his head, saying, so long as I can continue making more work in whatever shape or guise that might come, that's the only thing I'm bothered about. I wondered if he'd always been this neat the spotless confines of the studio so brightly lit that every twisted tube of acrylic and nylon brush was thrown into the sharpest relief. And I wondered why, if all he wanted was to continue pulling and scratching, he still felt driven to make more works. I must have wondered aloud, because laying a drab and amateurish daub on the floor, he responded, I found this painting some time ago. It's been done on the sort of old board I remember being given as a child and painting on. He propped the painting up. It depicted the facade of a cottage which looked strangely familiar, what with the brick chimney stack seeming its rough white rendering. Then, he resumed, some time later, I found this other one in a completely different part of the country, but painted on exactly the same board. Obviously, both these hobby painters had been looking at the same image. 
Indeed, they must have been, because the second amateur painting showed the side of what was clearly the very same cottage, a small projecting wing roofed with old and undulant tiling. You put them together, he said, doing just that, and they line up perfectly, so I'll make them into a diptych like this. An absurd statement, because two old bits of board propped up against each other constituted no sort of diptych at all. I can't have disguised my scepticism that well, because he came right up to me, bringing his pained face close to my own, and hissed, You don't want to end up just being a production line, making one thing after another. Think of it. To begin with, Herbert Austin was building cars with his bare hands and in his spare time. Then, a mere 50 years later, the long production line at Longbridge had snaked into being, carrying along with it the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations of thousands, but carrying them where? Into a future where numb fingers tighten nut after nut after nut. Sensing his distress, and so as to avoid any further revelations, I squatted down and examined the lean-to made from amateur paintings. As I peered, the tortuous surfaces seemingly self-smoothed while the oblique planes resolved themselves into two dimensions. It's a sort of trompe l'oeil impasto, he muttered. I use three or four different types of paint, so some of the pictures have acrylics, watercolours, household paint and oils. I asked him, how long has this been going on for? To which he admitted, I've been collecting the paintings for the last 18 years. 18 years? I could see him at car boot sales, way out in the sticks or flea-bitten markets in pestilential provincial towns, searching, always searching, searching for a way out of the self-spun conundrum of his own vision, and perhaps also the ineluctability of the visible itself. I could see him standing beside a stall cluttered with junk, his dinky little designer car was parked in the mid-distance. I could see him lift an amateur daub to his close-cropped face. I could hear him, hear him whisper under his breath, you always wonder what happened on the other side of the hayway. Then we were back in the Austin, and I was staring at the mascot dangling from the rearview mirror, the severed head of Jesus Christ, blood on his brows from his thorny crown, blood pulsing from the stump of his neck. The artist said, as he pulled out the choke, pumped the accelerator and turned the key in the ignition, my real driving force is to try and jumpstart people again. We live in a world that's image saturated, the virtual and the actual ever shuffling in our fervid minds. The magneto whined, the Austin's engine turned over a couple of times but didn't catch. We sat there listening to the quack of the ducks and the hiss of the geese as they scraped and shat on the banks of the mere. I wound down the window and poked my narrow brow out and peered down into the emulsifying waters. A wisp of white feather revolved atop a patch of oily scum, which in turn was stippled with the woolly dust of molting rowans. His voice came from behind my head. If the gallery were to photograph all the work five months ago, then now, then when February comes, well, they probably wouldn't see the difference. But for me, the changes are epical. He turned the key in the ignition again, and this time the engine started. The car humped heavily out of the mirror. Looking back, I saw our tyre tracks snaking over the sward, slickly insubstantial, as we drove along darkling lanes, plunging into and out of deep and overhung hollowways. I considered the relationship between sleight of hand and the epical. He had only to let go of the Austin steering wheel and the history of my world and his would come to an end. He doubled he clutched on a hairpin bend and the 948cc Series A engine whined horribly. I asked him if he ever left anything to chance, if the aleatoric had a significant role in his life or his art. He didn't reply for a long time, long enough for him to pull the Austin onto the forecourt of a garage to obtain the necessary change from the cashier and then pilot us into the great shaggy cradle of the car wash. He fed the coins into the unit and the huge roller brushes whirred into life. I am planning the next stage, 
He shouted above their drumming thrum and the splitter splatter of the sudsy water. But within that, there are, you know, I'm responding to the images because when I'm working flat out, it's they that become my landscape. Yes, a landscape of brushwork entirely, such as enclosed us then, a rough beast slouching past the Austin's windows on its way to some hitherto unimaginable Ortegeden. And of course, he resumed, that's also the reason I like working with an airbrush, because it's normally associated with either fantasy art or custom cars. He restarted the engine, drove out of his created world, and returned us to this one, with its too big and too small things, the botched pentagraphs of the ideal. Back at the station, he pointed out to me the labial concrete screens, one larger, one smaller, flanking the electric doors, doors which opened and closed, disgorging commuters, heading for home. L'origine du monde, he said, not that I wish to be facetious. He declined to shake my hand, saying he was suffering from some sort of repetitive stress injury, the consequence of maintaining constant and cramping pressure so that the finest of lines might be alternated with the smoothest and most undifferentiated of colour fields. As I say, he declined to shake my hand, yet when I reached Paddington and was striding across the concourse, I could tell from the waves of amusement rippling through the crowd that he'd left his mark all over me.